Uh, hello, my name is Yao Guoli. Um, the title of my talk today is 3D Inversion of Magnetic Data Affected by Remnant Magnetization. I'm with the Center for Gravity, Electrical, and Magnetic Studies at the Carrasco Mines. So uh, I should first mention the contributors of this subject, uh, uh, quite a few of them, including names listed here. And uh, the material in this presentation is part of the EAG education tour on gravity and magnetic methods in mineral and oil and gas exploration and production. There's a number of topics. In specific, we're uh, focusing on one part. A book accompanying the EAG uh, education tour is also available via the EAG bookshop. A uh, quick outline, uh, we'll start with a bit of background, uh, then we'll talk about three aspects of uh, the subject, direction estimation, magnetic amplitude data inversion, and magnetization inversion using FCM, and uh, conclude with a brief discussion. So on the background, uh, let's uh, look at one motivational data set. This is a small magnetic data set from the Victoria Island, Northwest Territory in Canada. The inducing field is pretty much 90 degrees vertical down, yet in the center there's a large negative anomaly among many small positive anomalies. Now the question is, how do we invert such a data set? Clearly the magnetization is reversed and has strong influence from remnant magnetization. Now the difficulty is captured in this slide. Uh, for four modeling, we really need to know both the magnitude J and direction of J hat of the magnetization. So for induced magnetization, J hat is equal to the B naught hat, which is inducing field direction. In the presence of strong remnant magnetization, the J magnetization is the vector sum of induced and the remnant component. In this case, we lose track of the direction of magnetization, therefore J hat is a unknown and it can also be highly variable throughout the source regime. So as an illustration, let's look at this more synthetic example. It consists of a dipping dike in a non-magnetic background. On the lower left uh, corner is the magnetic data total field anomaly in the presence of only weak induced magnetization. On the lower right corner, it is the magnetic data in the presence of strong magnet remnant magnetization with the direction totally different from inducing field direction. Now, if we take the data set with the remnant magnetization and invert it in two different ways. First, let's assume it's purely induced and use the inducing field direction, then the result is shown on the top left corner, which is totally nonsensical and we cannot do any geologic interpretation. Now, if we happen to know the magnetization direction and import that into a magnetic susceptibility inversion, the result is shown on the lower left corner, which has compact source body and captures the characteristics of the true source body shown on the top right corner. Now, in order to deal with this type of difficulties, there has been a number of methods developed. Uh, what we can present in this talk is three different approaches. First, we'll uh, estimate the magnetization direction and use it in the inversion. Second is use uh, a quantity that's insensitive to the magnetization direction, such as amplitude of the magnetic anomaly carried out the inversion directly. Third is the ultimate approach to do magnetization inversion, by which we, we recover both the magnitude and the direction of magnetization. So first one, estimate magnetization direction. This uh, only applies to single compact anomalies. In this case, we find a ways to estimate the magnetization direction from the data directly and then use it in the susceptibility inversion. There are not a large number of methods available. Uh, what we've found is in particular three approaches that works fairly well. First is Helbig's moment method that basically relates the moment of the magnetic anomaly of three components of them with the three components of the magnetic dipole moment. Second is wavelet method which looks at the maximum of the wavelet transform from where back up the uh, magnetization direction. The third is cross-correlation method. Basically, we can correlate the total gradient with the vertical gradient of the RTP field 
when we assume a particular magnetization direction, the maximum correlation gives us the correct estimated magnetization direction. Now let's look at the three methods applied to the synthetic data set, which is shown on the left of the screen. All three methods give fairly consistent results compared to the true value, which has inclination 45 degree, declination 75 degree. If you look at the 3D deviation of the estimated direction from true direction, they're all within 15 degrees, which is known to produce good invariant result. Now, if we take cross correlation result, apply it to the, uh, this data set with the susceptibility inversion, result is shown on the right side of slides. Uh, one cross section at north equal 500 meters and a plan section at depths of uh, 125 meters. We notice we capture the dipping structure and the location of the known susceptibility body very well. Now let's move on to the second method, which is magnetic amplitude inversion. The method basically avoids the need for the uh, magnetization direction. The reason is that this is the issue we're dealing with. We don't know the magnetization direction. In previous method, we tried to estimate that, which applies for a single compact anomaly. However, when the anomaly gets complicated, or there are multiple anomalies available, that approach is no longer uh, possible. Therefore, we have to do something different. In this case, there are several quantities that are insensitive to the direction of magnetization. One of them is the amplitude of the magnetic anomaly, which is basically sum of the squares of three components, and you take the square root. This method has been effective in uh, dealing with remnant magnetization, uh, in particular, uh, quite a few authors have used this in different contexts. This is an illustration of the weak dependence of amplitude data on the magnetization direction. This is a synthetic example generated for the case of inclination equals minus 5 degree, emulating the case in northern Brazil. In the uh, data plot, we see a black line showing the horizontal trajectory of uh, a source body. Top row corresponds to the uh, case of purely induced magnetization. The top left uh, uh, image shows the uh, total field anomaly in this case, which shows characteristic uh, trough in the middle and the positive anomalies to the north and uh, south. To the left of that is the corresponding amplitude data, which peaks around the horizontal location of the um, source body and uh, doesn't show any uh, strong um, or peak angles. The uh, lower row shows the case of uh, strong remnant magnetization, in which case the magnetization direction is changed almost perpendicular to the inducing field direction. Again, to the left of that row is the total field anomaly, which now looks like an uh, induced anomaly in the northern hemisphere. However, if you look at the corresponding amplitude data, which is again peaked around the horizontal location of the source body, which is very similar to the case of uh, purely induced magnetization, this is the basis we're going to use to do the inversion to recover the magnitude of the magnetization. So, a uh, statement of the uh, amplitude inversion, we uh, are given a set of amplitude data which is converted from the total field anomaly. Then we treat the effect of susceptibility as the unknown model, which is defined as the uh, ratio of the magnitude of the magnetization divided by the inducing field of strengths that forms the model. Of course, uh, we relate the data amplitude to the um, effect of susceptibility by a nonlinear forward mapping we denote by F. In this approach, we solve a constrained minimization problem. The objective function, again, consists of two terms. The data misfit, the first term, plus beta, the regularization uh, parameter times model object function, subject to the constraints that the effective susceptibility of the model is all positive. The reason is that we are dealing with the magnitude of a vector, the magnetization, which has to be positive by definition. Then we obtain the solution by logarithmic barrier method and Gauss-Newton minimization. And uh, specifically, the linear equation associated with this problem is solved through conjugate gradient method. So uh, let's again look at the uh, 
result of applying this method to synthetic uh, data set we've been using. Again, the data are shown on the left side of the screen. On the right side of the screen, we show the same two sections, the cross section at north equal 500 meters and the plant section at depths of uh, 125 meters. We notice that uh, we recover the general location of the source body very well, except we only have a very slight indication or hint of the dipping structure of the uh, source body. The reason for the lack of the dipping uh, structure or strong indication of the dipping structure is because the uh, a lot of uh, dip structure information is encoded in the um, phase of the data. Once we convert the total field anomaly into amplitude data, we lose part of phase information. Therefore, we lose some of the definition of the uh, uh, dip structure of the source body. Nonetheless, in this case, we avoided the need for the magnetization direction, yet we were able to recover a good representation of the source body. Now let's move on to the third approach, which is magnetization inversion. Uh, in this case, so let's look at the forward modeling again. On the right-hand side of this equation, we have the total field anomaly. Now the difference is that we are dealing with the magnetization as vector, the J, plus a, um, the uh, kernel function with uh, inner product with B0, which indicates the projection of the anomalous field onto the inducing field to form the total uh, field anomaly. The model to be recovered in this case is the magnetization, which is a vector consists of both magnitude and direction. So there has some work previously in noticeably uh, one particular work uh, paper by Lillery and uh, Oldenburg in 2009 is perhaps the first one that applies the generalized inversion to the magnetization inversion problem. What we have done is developed uh, a slightly different approach with uh, general uh, the applicable constraints. Now, in this case, what we're dealing with is, in fact, opportunity. We came along um, a long way trying to figure out how to deal with the case of remnant magnetization. Up to this point, we have been dealing with this as a difficult or obstacle to be overcome. However, what uh, we really have is a opportunity. The reason is the following. Magnetization magnitude or the susceptibility gives us definition of source configuration and the structure of the subsurface geology. We have not been able to use the magnetization direction thus far. However, once we can recover the direction of magnetization, that gives us something more, a new opportunity. The reason is the direction of magnetization, especially the remnant part, encodes the information about the past history of geology. Uh, therefore, that says something about source property from which we might be able to attempt geology, uh, so, uh, geology differentiation. So this is the statement for the magnetization inversion. We assume a set of total field uh, anomaly data. We're going to invert for 3D distribution of total magnetization vector. The model consists of three vectors. Each is the outbreak vector of uh, one component of magnetization. We can define the magnetization directions in each cell, J hat sub J, as the uh, normalized uh, vector, which is the direction we're going to work with, in addition to the uh, magnitude, magnitude of magnetization. So the second part of the statement is we have four modeling, which deals with three components of magnetization, and we calculate the total field anomaly. G consists of three concatenated individual matrices or sensitive matrices. And if we do this as a generic approach, then it forms a unconstrained inversion. The challenge is in the fact that we do not have sufficient information to determine 3D distribution of three components of the magnetization, since we only have one 2D map of data to work with. Therefore, uh, if you do this, the results are shown in this slide. The magnetization direction recovered from such a generic unconstrained inversion will be all over the map. In this case, we're plotting the magnetization direction as a polar plot. The circumference of this uh, plot shows the declination from 0 to 360 degrees. And we plot inclination 
90 at the center, zero towards the peripheral, and the positive inclination plotted as a plus, and negative used as another symbol. Now, what we would really like to do is to see the results that shows on the right part, right hand side of the slide. Basically, we should have a group of the direction that's fairly uh, clustered together because we have small number of source objects in general, and we would not ex expect the direction change all over the place. So, you know, to do this, we have developed a fuzzy Siemens FCM clustering technique which is borrowed from data classification uh, approach. The reason for this is inversion should have the flexibility to have arbitrary directions in each cell, but in general, a group of cells should have a similar or constant directions. So this is precisely the type of behavior described by fuzzy Siemens clustering, which is described by object function shown at the bottom of the slide, where J uh, has sub j is the direction in each cell, v sub k hat is the cluster center direction, we only assume a small number c of these clusters. u sub j k is a membership function that actually tells you the probability of each cell belonging to a particular cluster. So in this case, what we have is also the possibility of a, some estimate of directions, for example, we could have sample measurement from oriented samples, or we could have estimation directions from previous work such as amplitude inversion and follow-on work. Then these directions, denoted as T sub K hat, can be used as input data, and uh, they should be able to guide our, our solution towards a better one. So in this case, we have a guided fuzzy Siemens clustering, which consists of generic term for FCM, that's the first term, plus second term, which measures the distance between the uh, FCM determined class center V sub K and the true cluster center that's known from independent information T sub K. Uh, this then forms the total object function of the fuzzy Siemens clustering based magnetization inversion. The first line is the standard technique of regularization, and the second line with the gamma parameter as weighting have the uh, describes the um, fuzzy Siemens or guided fuzzy Siemens clustering method. Now let's look at the result from uh, uh, this approach applied to the same synthetic uh, uh, data set again shown on the lower left part of the uh, screen. The result is shown uh, to the right again in the two same sections, cross section, plan section. We see we recover generally the same configuration as two previous methods. However, what's more interesting is the direction of all the cells recovered through this method shown on the um, right part of the screen in the polar plot, which is the one we saw earlier, the desirable result, highly clustered, basically gives a consistent result. If you look at the one slice through the 3D model, notice the red portion, which corresponds to the anomalous region of the susceptibility or magnetization, the direction is highly consistent. That's what FCM has been able to achieve. Let's actually go back to the motivational slides at the very beginning. Again, we notice the center of the uh, map has a large negative anomaly, and if we recall, the inducing field is vertically down and positive inclination. Now, in this case, we see a negative anomaly that should be one cluster, we see a number of positive anomaly that should be second cluster. In general, it is good uh, practice to assume a third cluster that might be uh, dealing with the purely induced uh, magnetization. Uh, in this case, therefore, we have uh, three clusters assumed, and what we covered is actually indeed three clusters. We noticed on the right portion of the screen, the center part, the arrows all point vertical up, that is the part of the magnetization that gave rise to the central anomaly, which is negative. Then we see another group that's uh, oblique angle towards the northeast. That is one group of positive anomaly. Then the third group is pointing vertically down. That is corresponding to most likely purely induced magnetization. Now, this is uh, uh, the uh, opportunity I was 
talking about earlier, we have three groups of magnetization direction recovered. The class centers are shown on the right side of the screen. Therefore, we can directly use direction to say we might have three different categories of geologic unit that has magnetic property. This is the result shown on the, this slide. We call this geology differentiation. Basically, we have three categories of uh, anomalous magnetic material. The blue in the center, the right, uh, red colored as a part, and then yellow as another type. So this is something that can only be achieved through the magnetization inversion and making use of resulting directional information from the inversion result. With that, uh, let's sum up. We have discussed the three uh, approaches. First is magnetization direction estimation, which is basically very direct. We don't know something, we need it, we'll estimate it. Second part is we cannot estimate it, we avoid it and go, go around it. The third is magnetization inversion, which is really important Increasing the unknown and creates a new opportunity. So this slide sums up the current state of art for the magnetic inversion. We start with total field uh, anomaly data. To the very left branch, that's the traditional approach. We assume weak induced magnetization. We go ahead, invert the uh, total field anomaly, recover magnetic susceptibility. Now, if we do have strong remnant magnetization, then we've got a choice to make. If it's a single anomaly, complex source body, then we take the first route, uh, basically go ahead, estimate the magnetization direction, use that in the inversion, recover magnitude of magnetization. Now, if we have uh, multiple anomalies, then that option doesn't work. Then we can go with the amplitude inversion by converting the total field anomaly into magnitude amplitude data they invert amplitude data to recover the magnitude of magnetization. Now, ultimately, what we can do is, in any case, we can invert the total field anomaly directly to recover the magnetization, which consists of magnitude and the direction. That allows us to do much more than the traditional magnitude-based uh, uh, result. With that, uh, I would like to uh, thank Paul Sava and Paul uh, Spence uh, and EAGE for inviting me to uh, do the education tour. And also I would like to thank uh, Jules Lerois for providing the field data set, which helped much of the research on this topic. And uh, um, all the research results described here were produced by the support, uh, from support by the Gravity Magnetic Research Consortium, consists of a large number of industry companies. Thank you.